way, attendees, thank you for <laughs> listening to us work through the technology. And what a wonderful technology it is. Yeah. Because it's 7.02 and we have 83 participants. Wow. 80, someone got mad. <laughs> Okay, let's see here. Okay, Ryan, it will have you rejoin. Hello everyone, I see you checking in. This is wonderful. <laughs> Q and A's are starting already. Please don't. It's, it's, it, they asked, is that a cocktail you're having? <laughs> I wish, I wish. <laughs> That's after the history class. It's always after the history class. <laughs> this is my crystal light cherry pomegranate. <laughs> I love that. We're just letting the room populate a little bit more. We'll be starting momentarily. We're really glad you all are here. Wow, we're up to 90. This is fantastic. So attendees, so panelists, what do we think? We'll give one more minute. I'm waiting for you all to sort of give me the heads up. Yeah, let's so. give a couple more minutes since the numbers are changing and we're just waiting for Ryan to be able to uh, share his, okay, so he should be, uh, back on now. Look at these nice comments. It looks like we have about 16 people on YouTube so far. Holly, so we're good good job. Holly, thank you so much. We're glad that you're here. Oh, and we've missed having you in the class. <laughs> Edie said people are on two devices to making sure they could get in. Mm -hmm. And, and Miriam said, thank you for doing this. Oh, uh, and Annie is saying, happy to be here. We're happy that you're here, Annie. Annie Bachman. Here's Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Samantha. Hey, hey Ryan, <laughs> how are you? Ryan's muted. Oh, Un unmute. Okay, got oh, there you. Go. There you are. Our okay. panelists, are, our, our participants are coming in. So, um, group group twenty two. Oh, Jennifer, and, love to see you again. We missed you all. And Karen, there's a, there's a question for you. Ashley asked, uh, "What are some of the COVID nineteen aid Facebook groups you're a part of? You mentioned them in the last uh, class video." Oh, um. Mostly just different community groups. There's one called Dane County Neighbors Helping Neighbors that's uh, been getting a lot of action. Um, otherwise, just groups that are already set up. Um, so I guess I don't really have a good one in particular to, mess, to mention, but feel free to add those in the chat if you have uh, groups that have been working out great for you. And, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> And Linda, you had a you had a question. Let's see if this works. Did we? Oh, did I? She's still muted. Uh, might be muted. Hold on. Hmm. It looks like it might be easier to type the questions in. 
Oh, this is a good time for instruction. So uh, yeah. people out there, if you would like a question for the panelists to answer, um, it will be easier for us to find that. If you should see a little at the bottom of your screen, if you're on a computer, you should see a button that says Q&A. If you click on that one, it'll be easy, easier for us to track your question. And we have some people coming in from YouTube. Sean Walsh says she is holding it down on YouTube for us. Well, I think we can probably go ahead and get started then. Okay. Okay, give me just one second. I'm just... Um... <gasps> just letting some people know, <gasps> reminding them that we're on. Um... This is as good as my lighting is going to be today. <laughs> okay, so we can go. Yeah, let's go. Let's yep. do it. Hey, everyone. Cohort five, we have missed you. So come on, stand up. Stand up. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I couldn't resist saying that to you all. <laughs> Listen, um, thank you all for being um, so understanding and so kind hearted. It was a tough decision. Uh, not so tough because we care about your about your safety, but we really wanted to finish um, finish this process with you. And so it was with a lot of um, sadness that we had to cancel the last two sessions and the potluck. But we started putting our heads together because I like to hire brilliant people to be around me, and uh, and we figured out how to use technology to still have some some interaction. And so um, it's going to be really great tonight. We're going to. Um, we're going to watch it. We're going to, well, Karen will give us some instructions. Karen, did you get instructions already or? No, I'll do it again when you're done. But but tonight's lecture is very special. Um, it's It's been the last lecture for, I think, the, the last three cohorts. Dr. Christy Clark Pujara always teaches it and it's called The Cost of Apathy. Um, I don't know if you've read um, recent papers, but there are a lot of ethical discussions happening right now as to who gets ventilators. And I had a chance to um, have a discussion with Dr. Norman Frost, MD, who's one of the individuals who's helping the state of Wisconsin to really think about this. Um, and it was probably one of it. So it, it is a very sobering article. Um, you should just you should just Google his name. But um, the state is trying to figure out who gets ventilators and they're trying to figure out what um, the, the, the determining factor should be. Should it be age? Should it be pregnancy? Should it be, um, should it be pre-existing health issues? Well, when you start talking about pre-existing health issues, understanding that a, lot, a big part of the work of justified anger is taking a look at how race and the microaggressions um, that surround issues of race and racial isolation in places like Madison um, have become social determinants of health. And so we now know um, by the studies of many schools of medicine and public policy, that microaggressions, the stress that we're talking about by being isolated, the micro, the, 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 the racial tension that comes from worrying about yourself, your child, your spouse, your parent, these things all come to bear on the health of people of color in this state, particularly African Americans. And so one of the things that Dr. Frost has got to wrestle with is that if you were to look just at pre-existing issues, many African Americans would be ruled out for a ventilator. You begin to realize that for all of these years, the racial tension, the, whistle, the, 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 the dog whistle politics, the color blindness, the well-intentioned, um, all of these things that have happened have been building up inside people of color. And this is not just um, my analogy. This is not just um, my propaganda. Um, this is actually part of our work now. We work with, with the Wisconsin Partnership Program. Um, our work, even through this history class, is to show that if we bring white allies to the table to understand the impact of apathy, the impact of racism, that by changing policies, let me go in order, attitude, relationships, connections, and then policies could have a very positive impact on the health outcomes of people of color, particularly African Americans. We often talk about these issues as if it's just a poverty issue and poor Blacks not having access to, um, to, to, to health care. That's not true. Many, if not most of my African-American friends 
those who happen to be middle class, educated, who have insurance, still struggle with many of the stress related illnesses, including yours truly. And so I'm now watching this pandemic with a different um, perspective because it's not indiscriminate. Um, it's, it's, it's biased in that it's having an attack on folks who are dealing with these pre-existing issues. And at least in places like Chicago and Milwaukee, we're seeing that most of the deaths are among African-American people. Um, my job is to tie what we're about to hear with what we know and what we're currently understanding. This is why the work of Nehemiah and Justified Anger is really so important because it's not just COVID-19, it's the issues that we've been dealing with, with men and women coming out of prison, young children who are on, who are on um, individualized education plans. It's the stress of single mothers. It's the stress of sexual abuse and assault. It's all the things, the systemic realities that we've talked about and the apathy towards those things that now is being uncovered through this ugly pandemic that is not just the impoverished who are at risk, but as people of color who have these existing issues, pre-existing issues. So um, that's to me, it's heartbreaking to me because we're not just talking about Johnny reading. We're not just talking about um, Cassandra having someone to play with on the playground. We're talking about things that have been embedded in this community. And now it's, it's, it's amping up its vengeance on the lives of people who have already been oppressed and hurt and disenfranchised. So I want us to listen to Dr. Christy, Clark, um, Dr. Christy Clark Pujara's lecture, but I want us to look at this with new eyes and hear this with new ears, even as we look at what's going on with the pandemic. And I want you to connect the dots. I want you to begin to ask yourselves, when you hear about the numbers of people of color being killed, I want you to understand what that is. That's not poor people who lack insurance only. It's people who are dealing with the cost of apathy. And so, um, with that, I haven't, I, listen, I had to come heavy. I haven't been with you all for a while, but I, I, when I heard Dr. Frost say that, I almost crapped myself um, because the, real, the reality of that is so sobering that we do need to focus on the, the, the immediate needs and we will, but we still need to work on not only the pre-existing issues, um, conditions, but the pre-existing issues that cause that to be so. So Dr. Reese, I'm gonna stop there so that you can set us up for the lecture um, but I just want to say that, and just to just stress, I have missed being with you all. And um, this, all of this that we're doing with technology, we would have only done that with cohort five, only with cohort five. <laughs> Dr. Reese. Yeah, thank you for that. So um, just a couple of logistics. Um, I said this once, but I'm gonna say it again. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, if you're on a computer, and I honestly don't know what the exact instruction is if you're on the phone, but you can swipe around and, and look, you should see a couple of things. One is gonna be a chat window. If you type things in a chat window, um, you'll be chatting um, to the panelists. You may be able to choose an attendee to chat to. You can send those messages. If you want to ask questions, there's another bubble that says Q&A. So if you click there and type your question in Q&A. That's gonna be the easiest place for you to type your questions so that we can track them because then we're able to check them off once they're answered. We're going to watch a video from last year's history class uh, with Dr. Clark Pujaras. So we're gonna watch her video and then she's gonna come on after the video plays uh, to do some Q&A with us. So if you think of questions during the video, feel free to type them into the, um, to the Q&A box and we'll come back to those as soon as the video is over. We're gonna have two separate video clips to play. Um, and then this is really perfect timing um, with what we've got going on right now. Um, you're gonna hear some things about how we formed as a state in Wisconsin. You're gonna hear some things specifically about voting in Wisconsin and then what that means in terms of apathy. And so I, one thing that we're not gonna play that I just wanna um, set up real quick is Dr. Clark Pujar in this lecture mentioned um, at the very beginning last year that it would be like if she saw one of her friends in the class and this person had a folder in her hands and Dr. Clark Pujara went over there and took the folder out of her hand and started bopping her in the face with it. If none of us did anything, that's apathy. 
And by not doing anything, that means we're allowing her or we're giving her permission to continue doing it. So that's kind of the framing that she sets up the lecture. So Ryan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. If you can share um, clip one. Unmute myself. Okay, share desktop. And we're going to go to clip one and play it. Next slide. In the 1820s, Southern military officers brought more enslaved African Americans into the region. These officers included those who took advantage of the Army special allowance to purchase, lease, or hire servants and enslaved people. Throughout the 1840s, enslaved Black Americans performed <coughs> excuse me, a wide range of labor at Fort Snelling in St. Paul, at Fort Crawford in Prairie du Chien, Fort Armstrong in Rock Island. Found Black American men, women, and children were also held by officers posted at Fort Winnebago in Columbia County and Fort Des Moines in Montrose. It was the lead boom that brought more enslaved African Americans into the Wisconsin Territory. So what's on the Wisconsin state flag? There's a miner and a sailor. That miner is mining lead. Lead is why Wisconsin becomes a state. States had to reach a certain threshold of population before they could have, well, territories had to reach a threshold of population before they could apply for statehood. It was the lead rush that brought thousands of people of European descent to Wisconsin. It was the lead rush. In 1827, Henry Dodge moved to the territory from the slaveholding state of Missouri and helped set up a lead mine. How many of you have heard of Henry Dodge? Most of you have heard of Henry Dodge. He was the first territorial governor, Dodgeville, lots of things were named after him. Is it possible for you to make that a little bigger? So I like to bring in primary documents when I can, and if you can move it down a little bit. This is from Henry Dodge's personal papers. Um, his personal papers are held at UW Platteville in an uh, archive called the Southwest Room. It is open to the public. You can go to UW Platteville, go to the Southwest Room, ask for the Henry Dodge papers. Um, this is a series of manumissions, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. As you can see, you'll see the name Henry Dodge, and then below it, Tom, Jim, Joe, Lear, Toby, and the little X's by their names. Those are the X's that they made on this document. In 1827, Henry Dodge moved to the territory from the slave holding state of Missouri and set up a lead mine. He held Toby, Tom, Lear, Jim, and Joe in bondage. They labored as smelters at Henry's furnace. Henry had promised to free Toby, Tom, Lear, Jim, and Joe after six months, but held them in captivity for 12 years, despite the prohibition against holding slaves in the Northwest Territories. Toby, Tom, Lear, Jim, and Joe were finally freed on April 11, 1838, two years after Dodge became the first territorial governor of Wisconsin, and 12 years after they had come to the state, so, excuse me, to the territories. I say their names a lot, and I say their names a lot intentionally, because so many people know who Henry Dodge is, very few people know who built his wealth. And when I can't say their last name, I don't say his last name. Because they were denied something. Because they were understood to be property. Take slides. Next slide. In 1846, Paul Jones, an enslaved lead, an enslaved lead worker in Sassinawa, sued his enslaver. George W. Jones for $1,133 for, and I quote, trespassing on a promise to pay him wages. 
Paul lost his case and continued to labor for George Jones's benefit until 1842, when he was emancipated. Slavery was openly practiced in the Northwest Territories, but rarely has it been acknowledged. So why does Henry Dodge and George Jones emancipate them? They see the writing on the wall. They know that Wisconsin is going to come into the union as a free state, and it's a political liability for them to be slaveholders. But they free people after those people have enriched them, after they've built their homes, after they've built their minds, after they've built their mind. Next slide. Many emancipated Black Wisconsinites found their way to a place they named Pleasant Ridge, a free Black community outside of Lancaster, sometimes it's referred to as B-Town. Founded in 1848, it was populated by free Black migrants, fugitive slaves, and emancipated Wisconsinites like Paul Jones. Overall, Wisconsinites held very few slaves. By 1840, only 11 of the 196 Black people in the territory were enslaved. Nevertheless, the existence and practice of race-based slavery in Wisconsin shaped white attitudes about African Americans because they, like the rest of white Americans, associated Blackness with slavery, the antithesis of citizenship. Race informed evolving definitions of citizenship and worthy settlement. Brian, can I ask you to pause it for a second? Yes. All black people or enslaved. Yes. Okay. And although most I think I might not be on the um, they were uh, not abolitionists, right? So somebody who was anti-slavery, who was a free labor advocate, thinks slavery is wrong. One. Somebody who is an abolitionist thinks slavery is wrong and is Sorry. actively working to dismantle the. So if you can just pause the video, Ryan and then reshare your screen and you should see an option that says use computer audio. I'm, all right. So you are, okay, so start video, okay. And then share screen, oh, share computer sound, got there it. There you go. Okay. And if you could just back up just a, a few seconds. If, if you can start the you can start the video kind of where we left off. Yep, absolutely. Perfect. Share. Thank you. Share desktop and then think Perfect. slavery is wrong and is actively working to dismantle the institution of slavery. Wisconsin is primarily populated with anti-slavery free labor advocates. Fears of black migrants led white Wisconsinites to dispute abolition and the rights of black residents. So while the state served as a safe haven for fugitive slaves, black men were barred from voting until 1866, a few years before the 14th and 15th Amendment declared birthright citizenship and universal male suffrage. Wisconsin was progressive and oppressive at the same time. Next slide. It's not surprising that black male suffrage was contested in a free northern state. Of course it was. Because the nation as a whole sanctioned, protect, it sanctioned and protected race-based slavery, which I talked about in my first couple of lectures, so I won't do so again. Moreover, white Americans, north and south, were deeply invested in the business of slavery, the buying and selling of people and goods that sustain the plantation economy. Before 1800, only white male property owners could vote in most states, and political power was concentrated in the hands of a few. As new Western states came into the Union, suffrage expanded. By the time we get to 1820, most of the older states in the Northeast had dropped property qualifications. And by 1840, 90% of adult white men could vote. The disenfranchisement of black men was common throughout the North. In New Jersey, black men were vote, uh, banned from voting in 1807. In Connecticut, in 1818, the state legislature determined that although black men who had voted before that date could continue to vote, no new black votes would be allowed. Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts, none of which had a significant black population, made an effort to deprive black men of the vote. Rhode Island, New York, and Pennsylvania had protracted struggles over the issue. 
1822, Rhode Island denied black men were eligible to vote in its elections, but the vote was later extended to them in 1842. In New York in 1821, state constitutional convention defeated an attempt to retain property qualifications only for black men. Free blacks in the North experienced a very limited freedom. Most northern states barred black men from sitting on juries and serving in the militia. Northern states also had segregated schools and transportation and limited African-American employment opportunities. So this is Jim Crow before Jim Crow. Most white northerners wanted nothing to do with African-Americans. They considered black people inferior. They dismissed them as incapable of honest work and feared black competition for jobs. Right? So they're incapable of honest work, but you're scared they're going to take your job. We see this now, right? Hispanics are lazy, and they're going to take your job. How does somebody lazily steal a job is beyond me. <laughs> but racism doesn't have to make sense. Free blacks and, <coughs> excuse me, and please, no one take that out of context. I was being sarcastic. Um, <laughs> nearly every northern state considered and many adopted measures to prohibit or restrict the further immigration of blacks into their jurisdictions. Again, sound familiar. Especially the new northern states of Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Iowa, and Wisconsin all limited or banned black political and social participation. I'm telling you all this to give you context. So Wisconsin wasn't doing anything that was out of the ordinary. Okay. Next slide. In Wisconsin, black suffrage was affirmed and denied by early settlers and citizens. The 1846 Constitution would have put black male suffrage on the state's first ballot, but the Constitution was not approved, so that becomes a mute point. And I won't get into the reasons why it wasn't approved. One of the reasons was black male suffrage. So Wisconsin was supposed to be a state in 1846. It won't become a state until 1848, because that first constitutional convention fails. <coughs> the debate over black suffrage during the 1846 Constitutional Convention revealed overt racism among some leaders in the territorial government. They claimed that God sanctioned the separation of races and described black men as thieves and black women as far worse than thieves. These are direct quotes. They also urged, argued that the people of Wisconsin would not accept black male suffrage. And I quote, the people would deem it an infringement upon their natural rights, thus to place them upon equality with the colored race. Right? The people would deem it an infringement upon their natural rights, thus to place them upon equality with the colored race. So black suffrage was an affront to white freedom. Other delegates highlighted the hypocrisy and prejudice of these assertions. They noted that black men voted in New York without incident and that the denial of the vote was paramount to social and political alienation and affront to all free people. So they didn't go unquestioned. They didn't go uncontested. The state's second constitution explicitly excluded black men from the electorate. Approved in 1848, Wisconsin's founding document stated that adult white men, even non-citizens, could vote, as well as native men who were citizens and denounced all tribal affiliation. Right? So I want to break this down a little bit. So this is Article 3 of the state constitution. And on the other side was the resolution from the 1846 constitution. These are all things that you can go down the street at the Historical Society and see or go online at the Historical Society and bring up, right? Article 3 is very explicit. It says white. <laughs> you must be white to vote. So this language of white supremacy is in our state's founding document, right? And whiteness was so important that citizenship didn't even matter. If you read the second clause, it says, if you are a foreign-born white man who declares an intention, not that you're going to declare an intention to vote, once you've reached the one-year residency, you can vote too. So whiteness buys privilege immediately. 
right? It wasn't even about citizenship because whiteness and citizenship were so conflated that whiteness becomes what's important, not citizenship. And then when you read the subsequent clauses, it starts talking about Native Americans. Okay, so Native Americans are redeemable, right? They can vote only if they have no tribal affiliation, so no connection to their indigenous past, no connection to their own people. So they need to be culturally white. So again, whiteness becomes the measure of who can participate in this new society that is being built. Suffrage in a new state meant more than political power. It provided an opportunity to shape the state's institutions and society at large, including the institution I worked for, right? The UW system is created at exactly the same time that the Constitution is. Next slide. In 1848, the first state legislature held a referendum on black male suffrage. It was approved by a vote of 5,265 to 4,075. However, 31,759 voters did not vote on the referendum at all, and the State Board of Canvassers treated those abstention votes as no votes, banning black men from the ballot box. The apathy of thousands of voters had serious consequences for free black people in the state of Wisconsin. In 1855, the Wisconsin Republican Party adopts universal male suffrage as part of its party platform. African Americans quickly respond to the party's progressive position and circulate a petition in support. They held a meeting in Milwaukee on November 6, 1855. They adopted a resolution in support of the Republican Party and universal male suffrage. They had their proceedings published in the Milwaukee Daily Free Democrat and Sentinel. That's the, um, a picture of the, uh, of the um, minute meetings they had posted in the paper. Why do they do this, by the way? They want everyone to know that they're paying attention and that they know that they're being denied something, right? So that's why you pass around a collection plate and post it in the local paper, right? We're paying attention. We know what's happening. We know we're being marginalized. Two years later, in 1857, unable to build a consensus and widespread support, Wisconsin's Republicans dropped universal male suffrage from their party platform. The Democrats adopt a, re a resolution stating that they were, and I quote, unalterably opposed to the extension of the right of suffrage to the Negro race, and will never consent that the odious doctrine of Negro equality shall find a place upon the statute books of Wisconsin." End quote. You may be horrified today, but I always have to explain to my students at this point that the Republican Party was the Liberal Party and the Democratic Party was the Conservative Party because they are so confused by that that, you know, that switch happens. A referendum later that year confirmed that most Wisconsin voters agreed with the Democratic Party. Black male suffrage was defeated by a vote of 45,157 to 31,964. So this time around, most people vote, and they vote it down. Black Wisconsinites also petitioned the state for the right to vote, and some even presented themselves on election day. So they just tried to vote anyway. Um, October 1865, they held a mass meeting for suffrage that drew black people from around the state. Ezekiel Gillespie was one of them. Later that month, sorry, that's not working. Okay, right. later that month, Gillespie attended to, uh, attempted to vote, and he was turned away. Um, this time, he brought his friend and lawyer, Sherman Booth, to witness him being turned away. Right? This is a setup he intends to sue. So after he was turned away from the polls, Gillespie sued. His case made its way to the state, state Supreme Court. <coughs> Excuse me. Next slide. An 1865 referendum on black male suffrage again reaffirmed white Wisconsinites' opposition to black men voting. They voted the referendum down again by a vote of 55,000 
591 to 46,588. That would have been the end of it, if not for a Gillespie suit, which was scheduled for review by the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The court agreed that Gillespie indeed had the right to vote, as the 1849 referendum had been wrongly interpreted by the Board of Canvassers. The court's decision invalidated the ban on black voting and confirmed that suffrage had legally been extended to black men in 1849. So the court rules on the technicality. They say what the State Board of Canvassers did in 1849 was illegal. They should have only counted the votes that were cast and should have never counted the um, abstentions as no votes. For 17 years, black men in Wisconsin were barred from the ballot box and their disenfranchisement excluded them from shaping the, first, the state's first public institutions. But black Wisconsinites refused to accept their political marginality and their efforts alongside those of white advocates made Wisconsin the first state in the Midwest to enfranchise black men without restriction. This is a hand-drawn map. Again, it's at the Wisconsin Historical Society that is outlining how the counties voted in 1865 concerning black male suffrage. Right? The red is against and the blue is for. This was one of those things that I got excited about and I knew that I had picked the right career because I get excited about like hand-drawn maps <laughs> in the archive. Right? Next slide. So, Wisconsin is a confounding place. And what I mean by that is that they're progressive and oppressive at the same time. The same state that has this protracted struggle over black male suffrage. And to put this into context, if every black person had voted like 10 times, it wouldn't have mattered. Their numbers were so small. It's not like that they were gonna create any kind of block, right? But what the fight over suffrage tells us is how important white identity was, right? Because they pose no political threat. But when you read the debates, they're like, if we let black people vote, one, more of them will come, and two, that tears away at citizenship because citizenship is white, right? And so it actually tells us a lot about white identity, right? <coughs> but this is also the same state in which Glo Josh Joshua Glover, a runaway, um, is literally broken out of jail. Like, he's arrested for being a runaway, He's put in jail in Milwaukee. A band of white abolitionists literally tear the door off of the jail and help spirit him away to Canada. In the same state where a few black men can't vote. Right? So it's progressive and oppressive at the same time. So they are anti-slavery, but not black people should have equal rights, right? You're passing through, great. You want to stay here, not so much. And it's that complexity of racism about the past that we need to understand. It's all of these shades of gray. It's, it's layered. It isn't as simple as Wisconsin was progressive or Wisconsin was oppressive. It was both of those things at exactly the same time. And what does that tell us about the identity of the place, right, and how we think of ourselves now? Um, and this mural and this plaque are in Milwaukee today. You can go and see them. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that's the end of our first video clip, and Ryan is going to queue up our second video clip. And by the way, Ryan is the guy that always runs the microphones in our classes. You don't usually get to see him. So this is like a rare view of the amazing Ryan Smith. Ryan, Ryan. <laughs> ...across this collection. Um, and then he begins to search for more. And in 2005, he publishes it. 
In 2005, the U.S. Senate apologized for lynching. And that's the, all right, so I'm going to read a little bit from the apology. But before I get to that, African Americans had been imploring their government and their neighbors and white America for decades that this was happening, that it happened. And everyone said they were exaggerating, um, that they were lying, that they were overblowing things, right? That this couldn't be happening, not at this scale, not at this level of gruesomeness. But the photographs don't lie. I'm always struck by who's in attendance. These are festive events. People dress nicely. The whole family's there. People bring their children. People pose. Nobody is the least bit concerned about being associated with these events. No one is scared. No one's concerned. Sometimes the cameraman seems like they must be miles away to get the panoramic views that they're getting of these lynchings. These are community events, killing black people and watching them die and watching them be tortured was an American pastime. I can't watch police killing videos because they're too reminiscent. And we have to understand those things in context. They don't just exist right now because. There is a long history of black lives not mattering in this country. And scholars who teach this kind of thing have been saying that for decades, right? That doesn't just happen. It doesn't just come from nowhere. And disbelieving black people and their experiences is also as American as apple pie. They're lying. They're exaggerating. It couldn't possibly be that bad. What did they do? What caused that? But what's most shocking to me about the lynching photographs and the notices in the papers are the incredible lack of shame. Right? And what a lesson this is for children on who matters. Right? Like, you go to a lynching and you know. It's, it's crystal clear to you. So in 2005, the U.S. Senate apologized for lynching. And you might say, why is the entire U.S. Senate apologizing for lynching? I'm just going to highlight a few things. Let me start going down. Whereas the crime of lynching seceded slavery as the ultimate expression of racism in the United States following Reconstruction, whereas at least, and I'm not going to read all of these, 4,742 people, predominantly African Americans, were reported lynching in the United States between 1882 and 1968. Whereas 99% of all perpetrators of lynching escape from punishment by state or local officials. Whereas nearly 200 anti-lynching bills were introduced in Congress during the first half of the 20th century. Whereas 200 anti-lynching bills were introduced in Congress during the first half of the 19th century, organizations like the NAACP came into existence because of lynching. And African Americans did what society at large and what their government said they should do if you have a grievance. You implore a representative to take it to the floor of Congress for you. And they did that 200 times in 50 years. That's roughly twice a year African Americans begged their government to do something, to do anything. And so when I hear people talk about a proper way to protest, when I hear people talk about, well, if you go about it the right way, well, they went about it the right way 200 times. And 200 times, the U.S. Senate passed. 200 times, they said, 
moving on. And why did they say moving on? Because the vast majority of their constituents did not care. Politicians respond to what their constituents care about. And the vast majority of their constituents did not care. Apathy is dangerous. How many of us care about the Black Lives Matter movement? Whether you agree with their tactics or not, just the statement should not be controversial. And within the context of the United States and Black Lives Not Mattering, the assertion that Black Lives Matter is in no way provocative. It's not saying that other lives don't matter. It's just saying, let's pay attention to this, this problem that we have had since our inception. Let's pay some attention to it. And somehow, that's provocative. That's controversial. And so when people say it's disrespectful to kneel, well, it was pretty disrespectful for the Senate to ignore African Americans asking their government to do the bare minimum. And the bare minimum is to protect your life. That's why the government exists, which they admit. Whereas the protection against lynching was the minimum and most basic of federal responsibilities, and the Senate considered but failed to enact anti-lynching legislation despite repeated requests by civil rights groups, presidents, and the House of Representatives to do so. I always teach this apology because it's really kind of absurd. How do you apologize for this? There are many people and many organizations within the African American community that talk about the man that are distrustful of the system, and it's grounded in a real experience. When this is your experience with the system, why would you trust it? How many police officers, court officials, judges, Congress people, senators, upstanding members of the white community saw lynching and did nothing? If black people trusted the system, that would be absurd. It's a system that failed them, and it's a system that continues to fail them. I have probably one of the most kind of boring, sedate jobs you can have as a history professor. I uh, am afraid of committing any crime. Just I'm adverse to getting in trouble, right? <laughs> My mom said I was a holy terror at home, perfectly behaved at school. I see the police behind me, I start sweating. Never committed a crime in my life. But I was in the truck every time my dad got pulled over for his tail light was out and we were on our way to the auto shop or he didn't yield enough feet away from the stop sign and so that has informed how I understand and interact with the police. Because I saw my father, who was nothing but a law-abiding citizen, a hard worker, always had two to three jobs, a deacon in his church, harassed throughout my childhood. My friends pulled over and questioned. So I get nervous. I haven't done anything, right? Because I don't trust the system. I got called for jury duty, and I'm sitting there, and uh, you know they make you go really early, but I'm sitting there, and the judge keeps telling us that the uh, accused is presumed innocent, presumed innocent, and I keep thinking, when are we going to make that real, right? When are we going to make that really meaningful to everyone? So when we're thinking about what we can do, we must think about action, right? Facebook posts aren't enough. Conversations with your friends and family and neighbors are a good place to start, but that has to translate into something real 
and meaningful because apathy, even sympathetic apathy, has a cost. If we're not asking for political, economic, and social change, then we're part of the problem. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>
what we choose not to say, um, what we choose not to engage in. Matters. I, I, thank you for that. For that. Um, for that. In, for that explanation. And it's very important to to clarify that, particularly in a place like Wisconsin, where our state motto is forward, and particularly in a place like Madison, where, where we talk a lot about the progressives. It's one thing to see racial injustice and not say anything. That's that's bad. But if you call yourself um, woke or an ally and you say nothing, it's really it's really horrific. And what I have found is that many people feel that being an ally is to come to me and say, you know, this person made a comment about black people and and um, I, and they're telling me what the person said, but yet they didn't say anything to the person who said it to them. So some people think that justice is telling you what people are saying about black people and they're not talking, they're not speaking with each other. So I just wanted to clarify that. I know we've got lots of people um, that want to ask questions, but I, I just have to say that whole lecture- I just have one thing. I just lost the picture. Can you guys still see me? We can, yes. Okay, all right. So I'm just not sure where to look because I lost the picture, but that's okay. Okay, let's see, that's interesting. But we still, we still see you fine. Okay. Well, I will just stare at the Zoom and uh, <laughs> the, the Zoom long go because I well, don't want to mess with anything and mess up the connection. Mr. Hawkins, are we getting questions yet? Um, yes, we do have one. Um, so the this uh, person said the end of the lecture was very inspiring, but they also remember Dr. G a few weeks ago when you talked about well white uh, well meaning white people taking action that ended up doing more harm than good. So how can uh, allies best navigate taking meaningful action and being deliberate and making informed choices? How can they navigate that tension between the two? I think making informed choices is critical. Um, and by informed choices, I mean speaking and listening to the community. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Following rather than, because I think oftentimes you'll have a white ally who has their idea of how they can improve things. And they've spent no time in the community listening to people to allow the group that has been marginalized to take the lead. They know what they need. Um, an assumption that you know what a group of people needs is racist. This idea that, you know, I know best and I'm gonna show these people how to be successful in this world is really arrogant and that does a lot of harm. Um, and so it's paramount that if you're going to be an ally, you're an ally who listens to people, um, who understands that there are parts of the culture that you may not understand, but you take the lead from the people within that culture. Um, no, thank you for that. Another, another question. Uh, Dr. Clark Pajar, can you speak to the threats that black suffrage uh, of black suffrage in Wisconsin today? And how do you take a stand uh, for expanded suffrage? How can you take action to expand suffrage? Well, I mean, if we look at our most recent voter ID law, that was a law that served to disenfranchise poor people. And African Americans are disproportionately poor, um, especially in Wisconsin. And so a law like that can seem tone deaf and classist, meaning that you know you need to have certain forms of ID, um, ideally a passport, and the people who have passports tend to be people of means, um, or you have to have the real ID. So I have to get to the DMV and have a special kind of ID that requires different kinds of documents that you may or may not have access to. The DMV has limited hours and caters to professionals who are salaried and can leave their jobs when they want. And so there's a whole host of things that may seem on its face just to be classist, but when African-Americans have been marginalized socially, politically, and economically for centuries in this country, a classist law is a racist one too, um, because African-Americans tend to be um, disproportionately poor. But if we look at what has happened in the past 24 hours with the election that we are now being forced to hold tomorrow, where is the epicenter of the outbreak of, the, of COVID-19? It is in the middle of the black community of a segregated city that was intentionally segregated, right? And 
a place that usually had almost 200 polling places is now just going to have a dozen or so. And people that are in the epicenter of the COVID-19 are being asked to risk their very lives to cast a ballot. Evers tries to issue an order. Well, he did issue an order to stop the election. Our Supreme Court rescinded it. And the US Supreme Court just, what, an hour or so ago supported that decision, right? And so the very people who have the most to lose are being asked to risk their very lives to participate in this vote. And if we even just take a minute and think about COVID-19, who does it most affect? Who's dying at the highest rates? The people that were already the most vulnerable, the people that already had underlying health issues, the people that live in environments where social distancing is all but impossible to do. And so, I mean, those things just really come together in this moment right now. You know, I just want to just add in, um, your, your, um, the fact that you brought up COVID-19 and, and where it's, where, um, how it's working in places like Milwaukee um, tied into my opening comments that we're seeing the apathy play itself out even in who's dying um, from the disease. And so it's, it's just so interesting that, that you're saying that. My concern is so much attention will be put on COVID-19 that we will forget why it's impacting certain communities the way that it is. And so we'll focus on relief efforts, but not understand the underlying issues that made certain places um, the epicenter. Um, and so as we're encouraging our participants to, to not be apathetic, don't just, don't just look at the fact that, that black people, people of color, poor people are dying more, but ask yourself the hard question, why, 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 why? Because that will continue to be real even once a vaccine comes out. Those issues are still very prevalent and it'll be uncovered by something else, Katrina or something, some other catastrophe will, will, un, will uncover um, how apathetic we've been towards these issues of discrimination. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's no surprise where, the worst of it is happening. It's happening in inner cities and in some very neglected rural areas because those are the places that lack the infrastructure. Those are the people that are least likely to have health insurance. So they already have so many underlying issues. And, you know, I think about myself. So as being a state employee, I have great health plans to choose from. And my health care uh, provider sent an email a couple of days ago, Quartz, saying, we will not even charge you a copay if you are sick with COVID-19, go make sure you're okay, right? That is a completely different position to be in than folks who have little to no access to healthcare and them going in um, before they're super sick and have no other choice could mean bankruptcy, right? And we've chosen as a society not to have universal healthcare. Right, And so this is just highlighting the inequities that already exist in our society. And when we vote, we need to be thinking about the most vulnerable people. When we are having conversations about racial justice, we need to be thinking about the most vulnerable people. Um, and I think that this is a reminder of that. Yeah. And, and how, how would you recommend uh, people making a difference against such large systems um, and things that seem um, that are so big that people are just resigned? Well, I think that we have to start thinking smaller. Um, and one thing that always comes to my mind is when we look at when people are most politically engaged, it's usually during like a presidential race, right? People are very few people are really politically engaged when we're choosing a Supreme Court justice or who the sheriff is going to be or who the county commissioner is going to be or who's going to be on the school board um, or who's going to be the local DA, right? Those are people who have immediate impact in communities. And if people like the lovely people that are in JA are calling the sheriff's office and saying, what is your policy on diversity training and inherent bias and inclusion? Where do you stand on these issues, 
right? That it's not always about going out and voting for the president. It's about pressuring these local um, government entities. It's about asking the DA why they're prosecuting certain things and not prosecuting other things. It's about asking the county commissioners where the budget money is going and why, and are they concerned about racial justice and who has access to, you know, parks and libraries and clean water. That if we put pressure on our local officials to deal with the everyday discriminations that people have to deal with, and I'm not saying that like a presidential election isn't important. It's critical, but our lives don't end and begin there that we have to be engaged with our local officials as well. And if we flood, like I said, the DA or the sheriff's office or the county commissioner's office with questions about racial justice, if they know that that's something that people are concerned about, care about and vote about, they change their policies. Mm. You know, um, and what, how, would you, how would you recommend navigating conversations with loved ones who don't recognize their biases and are acting or speaking in a racist manner? I think when we let things slide because it's uncomfortable, we reinforce the system, right? That you have to be that person that speaks up, but I think you have to do it in thoughtful ways because if not, I think people just tune you out and you just become that, you know, crazy racial justice crusader, which, you know, that's not a bad thing to be. If there's going to be something you're labeled, that's probably a good thing to be labeled. Um, but to engage people in a real and meaningful way and to engage them in a way that if, if, if they're your uncle, your, your aunt, your grandmother, you know something that is meaningful to them whether it be, you know, sports or religion and try to talk to them from that angle and give them concrete examples, right? Because I think so many times people talk about racism in an abstract form and it doesn't mean anything to someone, but to try to give them concrete examples, uh, to try to get, you know, buy them uh, the, the new Jim Crow and read it with them right? Do that kind of hard work, have a family movie night and watch um, uh, 13, right? Those mm -hmm. are the kind of things that I think um, can matter and keep engaging people. Um, and I also think it's important not to write people off um, because it often takes um, an incident, a learning moment to get where many of the people in JAR. Um, and so to not give up on people, um, but I think one of the most important things you can do is raise your children to have a racial justice lens. Give your nieces and nephews books that talk about racial justice. Be that member of the family that kids know that they can go to to talk about these issues because it's much easier to raise empathetic people than it is to try to change somebody's mind when they're 60. Mm. True sure that. That's indeed. Um, so I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, um, let me just take my hand down right here. Um, one thing I want to say too is I feel that many of our would be allies downplay the importance of educating yourselves. I, this is our fifth cohort, and we still get comments saying, Where were the black people? We thought that we we're going to take this class with black people as if it's hard for people to grasp, the best work that you can do right now is to understand these issues, understand yourself. Think about that James Baldwin quote that basically says, if you, you study what's happened to black people so that you understand America, because America was built on the shoulders of black people and then built to be separate from the benefit of black people. So when we offer our follow-up next step courses, more of you should follow up. Um, the, the attendance drops off drastically. We offer book groups, we offer ongoing training and people will still write us and say, we don't know what to do for the next step. So I think it's important to understand that we don't need you to go turn your company around overnight, but you can have discussion and really educate yourself so that you know the issues um, personally and not just enough to regurgitate them in an argument with someone. Do, if you run a small business or you're an executive, do like um, Alex and Shanae at um, 
um, short stack. They require their staff, their leaders to come to the class every year. Um, you're part of a company, ask your boss, your bosses. Can, can we send HR to this? Can we send vice presidents to this? Keep cycling your people through it. But the education piece is so important. No one goes straight to battle. They go through boot camp. They go through training so they know how to handle themselves in combat. And I feel that so many of our well-intentioned would-be allies go right from the enlistment office to the front lines. So just take a moment to understand, process the history, then ask yourself, why don't I know more people of color? Why don't I know more black people? And don't just say because, well, they don't live near me because you now have the tools to understand why they don't because of certain types of covenants. So begin to ask yourself the tough questions because it starts by, as Dr. Clark Bajara said, raising your children, educating yourselves, asking the tough questions because the best thing that you can do as a would-be ally is to become a true ally and you can support the work of those that are doing the work and training folks to do this. That is very, very important. And sometimes I sort of feel that people think that's not the real work. The real work is pushing your sleeves up. Sometimes the real work is standing behind the people who know the real work and learning the real work from them. And just to add to that, I think it's really important to understand that there isn't an endpoint to this. You know, I've been studying African American history since. I was in college, you know, and I'm 40 now. So have more than half my life, right? And I've been working on issues of inclusion and racial justice for about the same amount of time. And I learn something new all the time. Like there's not an end game. There's not a, I've reached a point where I know um, it all, right? That there's always a new angle. There's always something that you didn't think about. There's always a perspective. Um, that you haven't considered um, and to understand that this is a lifelong journey um, and to be open and honest about the mistakes that you make and self-correct. One of the things I always try to do is to be really honest with my students. Um, and a couple of years ago in class, it, you know, I try to get all of these kind of racist language out of my vocabulary. But some things stick and I was in class and I said, bottom of the totem pole. And mm. I stopped myself and I said, I apologize for saying that. I explained to them why referring to a totem pole in that way was disrespectful to native people. And um, that that was something, in, you know, a phrase in my, in my language that I was trying to get rid of. And I spent about five minutes. That was a year that I received a teaching award. And one of the things that the students had said was she corrected herself. She apologized in front of us. And I didn't think it was a big deal, but they thought it was a really big deal. Um, and I realized that that gave them permission uh, to mess up and self-correct and to understand that this is a continual process, that you don't reach a point where you have learned all you need to learn and you can turn it off. Just wanted to comment um, quickly on that. Uh, the point about um, living in a place where we don't have great numbers of black people and so how can you learn and how can you overcome that challenge? Well, first of all, technology is one great way um, you know, if you're on here, you're getting towards the advanced stage of accessing technology. There are all kinds of YouTube videos, um, Facebook groups, things that you can go and look and listen um, to what Black people have to say in a way that's not intrusive and doesn't cause harm just by watching a video, listening to a recording, and then reminding yourself that not all Black people think the same way. So you're going to find differences of opinion out there. Listen to all of them. Don't just listen for the thing that sounds best to your ear and say, okay, this is how they think, right? That's not how it works. So make sure you watch a lot of these videos, watch movies that are in the subject area, um, follow our Justified Anger YouTube channel, watch the videos that are on there, and then look around in the Madison area and see where you can put yourself in a position to interact with people, fewer white people. So one thing you can do is a Juneteenth celebration every June that's happened in Penn Park for the last 30 years. Look for things like that. Even if you're not Christian, you'd be welcome to attend a church. Um, go set up your laptop at a library on a Saturday. Uh, go do a load of laundry at a laundromat. Take the bus from your home to downtown. 
there are lots of things you can do um, to get exposure. And just remember that you're learning, you're observing, um, and you don't need to jump right into interacting. And then again, just to um, echo Reverend G, just take your time. Yeah. Um, here's, here's another question to kind of piggyback that one. Um, is there a, histor a historical precedent for rethinking and changing racist systems after a major crisis? Uh, what are the practical actions during and after this crisis to help uh, further this work? I mean, I think the, the one that's coming to mind is uh, truth and reconciliation, right? That happens in South Africa. Um, but also if you think about what happened with the Nuremberg trials, if we think about um, paying reparations to Japanese, um, to the people that were interned in, um, uh, why am I blanking on the name of the, not concentration, internment camps, right? So there are models, um, but I think what's difficult in the US is that most Americans know so little about the history of slavery and capitalism and the failures of reconstruction um, and the political and social um, impulses that created Jim Crow that people think that there doesn't need to be a major corrective. And I think that we are still in the education um, portion. Um, for instance, when I tell people that I specialize in Northern slavery, they just like look at me like I'm confused, right? Or, I mean, I really think that we as a nation, the way that our education system has been constructed, that most people um, buy into the bootstrap uh, uh, ideology that, you know, people are poor because, you know, some people work hard and some people don't. And they, you know, and poor people don't know how to budget. Um, that that we haven't really reckoned with our history to then take our history and make change. Um, because truth and reconciliation requires a grappling with what happened. And I don't think we're there yet, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, are you aware of any journalists or networks that are taking on or putting pressure um, on the uh, community to talk about how COVID-19 is affecting racial uh, communities, um, not just age and gender, but um, th this person would be curious how to see those questions, um, really people answering the questions and how they're affecting the African-American community. Yeah, and I think it depends on what um, kind of media you expose yourself to. If you expose yourself to black media, this has been highlighted repeatedly. Um, if you are just kind of watching some mainstream media, you probably don't know that the vast majority of COVID deaths have been concentrated among African-Americans. Um, and this goes again to where you get your information from. Um, Gary? Oh, go ahead, please. We also don't know at this point um, to what degree African-Americans have been denied respirators or ventilators thereby causing more deaths. We, that hasn't been answered for us yet. Um, there are discussions happening in Wisconsin right now about the criteria, as I mentioned earlier, and some of the initial criteria unfairly disqualifies African-American people. So I think what we'll need to do, and this may be part of the work that we can, that we can um, um, move into with some of our, some of our JA um, 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 supporters or, or allies, is we need to find the data to, to, to figure out how many of these black deaths are attributed to a lack of, ventilator, lack of ventilators. And sadly, we know that there is incredible racial disparities in healthcare. And something like this only exacerbates those issues. Like it doesn't just go away. All we have to do is take a look at something like maternal death or our heart attacks or who's being turned away from ERs with symptoms and that kind of thing. So unfortunately, we, we pretty much know that when there's this kind of panic and stress, systems that were already discriminating against 
African Americans are just going to continue to do so at an accelerated rate. Um, and I think that goes back to what Reverend G said was that this is exposing those disparities that were already there. It's highlighting them. Um, but if you listen to, you know, CNN, which, you know, is a new source I listen to, very little about how it's affecting the African American community. But if you read online Black sources, I mean, it's the top story. You listen to BET News, right? It's, it's right there. It's front and center. You know, um, someone asked a question as well, um, because early in your talk, your recorded talk, um, you mentioned the presence of slavery and enslaved African Americans in Wisconsin. And we're curious if you have more to share about what, um, your book that you're writing now. Well, um, I haven't written anything in the past month. This, uh, this shift <laughs> to uh, online teaching and my kids being home has uh, the books at a standstill um, <laughs> right now. But it is um, something that I'm increasingly interested in. And um, it's really exciting to be doing this work because the Midwest for the past, I'd say 10 years or so has really experienced a renaissance as far as historians looking and thinking about the black experience prior to the great migration. Um, most people tend to think about African-Americans in the Midwest as something that happens toward the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century um, and not looking at the history and experiences of people of African descent um, in the Midwest, um, in the upper Midwest uh, well before that. And you know, there's a series of books that have been done and I'm happy to put together a list to send that out to folks. Um, other than a kind of apologist narrative, uh, which was like, oh, slavery wasn't that bad in Wisconsin. That was written in 19, 1901 or 1906. There really hasn't been a treatment, um, a historical analysis of the experiences um, of both free and enslaved black people um, here in the, uh, basically the 1700s through um, the American Civil War. So I'm in the process of, of, well, I was in the process of writing that book. Uh, one thing that has really um, struck me was, you know, I thought that I was going to have to grasp at straws for sources. And um, there's more sources than I ever thought there was. Uh, there's more mentions of, both free and enslaved black people uh, in Wisconsin before the Civil War. And it excites me and angers me at the same time. It excites me because it's, it's exciting to tell their stories, um, to give voice to these people that for the most part have been voiceless. And they have incredible stories of um, resilience and uh, just never giving up no matter what the odds were. But it ang angers me as well because these sources were seen um, by historians for decades and they chose not to tell their stories. Uh, oh. They chose to craft um, a kind of little house on the prairie um, ideal of what the Midwest looks like. Well, um, and I think we might have question, time for maybe one or two more questions, but um, here's one. How can our population at large learn what we are learning? How can this be promoted in our community and schools? I think you have to inundate schools with why aren't my children learning these things? Because I think black parents have been asking schools these questions for a long time. I know my parents did. Um, but I think when white parents begin asking these questions, mm. it'll look and feel differently. Right? When white parents begin to demand something beyond a African-American history day, week, um, or month, or let's learn about you know, uh, who invented the stoplight. And I'm not knocking that, but that's often where it begins and ends. Like, let's learn a litany of facts about Black people, and then that be it. Um, and that is really problematic. Um, an insistence on telling the African-American experience as it is part of the American experience, because that's the problem. Ideally, I shouldn't have a job 
that is specifically about the African American experience in a department that is dedicated to telling the stories of people of African descent. The reason why I do is because of the exclusion that has happened about the stories of Black people for decades. Can can I uh can I put you guys on hold for just a second? Mm -hmm. I'll be right back. Yeah. Sure, sure. And a uh, so, couple, couple of questions that we might be able to answer um, while while uh, we're waiting. One, um, there were a couple of questions about black news outlets or media outlets. So I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about that. Um, and also, if anyone is interested in reading Dr. Clark Pujar's first book, A Dark Work, um, I link that uh, to Amazon or wherever you want to buy it. But that's a link to that particular site in the chat window. Harry? Yeah, good. Oh, you got a question? No, no, I, I guess I'll just, I just make it as a statement. Um, just something that I think is important to um, just to keep in mind. Dr. Clark Pujara talked about um, um, foreigners who are in who are in the United States who are granted the ability to um, to vote after being here. I believe she said after a period a year, um, if they had the intention of becoming citizens. That reality, along with the reality that many Europeans came to the United States to make um, farming tools, as Dr. Clark Pujara said, so that um, so that slaves had clothing and tools to, to continue to work in the fields. Those are two things that people need to keep in mind when they say, well, my great grandmother came here, my great grandfather came here, didn't have a job, didn't speak the language. You need to understand some of the things that were left in place because of apathy that allowed folks to, who, were, who were foreign to the United States to come and pass up those who had been here for centuries um, when it benefited them um, financially. So I just thought that was a very salient point that Dr. Clark Pujar made about um, folks who were considered foreign had an ability to, to, to vote. And again, these are things that have just been allowed for so many centuries that, um, that have caused injustice in our, in our system. So I just wanted to underscore that when people think about what do we go, where do we go next? Understand how those rules have influenced your family and given you the, the leg up, so to speak. Understand that. And I think being able to speak from that experience is so much better than being able to quote from a book or a jet magazine. Understand how these issues have had a direct impact on you and your family and your economic stability. And I think that will help you communicate in a very real way with your friends and colleagues. And Karen, how are we doing on time? Uh, 8.30 was the scheduled end of our Q and A. Okay, so. okay. So that's a good that's a good break. And what we'll do is um, there might have been a few questions that we didn't we didn't get to. We'll try and cover some of those answers in our recap email because um, we I wanted to kind of keep us on point so we could get to our next piece. But thank you all for for sharing. And don't leave yet because there is a next piece. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's one question before we transition that I wanted to I answer, but I wanted to answer for uh, for everyone live. Um, someone asked about donating. They said they wanted to donate, but they were curious if we gave to Nehemiah, if that would help out Justified Anger, and it very much would. So Justified Anger is not its own uh, entity. It's an initiative of Nehemiah. So any, any money that goes to um, Nehemiah helps out Justified Anger. If you want to, you can put a note in saying you want to go to Justified Anger, and we'll make sure it goes to those programs specifically. But really, our staff works across both parts of our programming. So the uh, systems piece and our direct services. So either way, we will be more than happy to receive any gracious donations. And we'll put a link in the, e the follow-up email so that it's very easy for people to make those tax deductible donations. So uh, with that, I just wanna thank you so much, Dr. Clark Pujara for uh, stepping in here. We always really appreciate um, your lectures and everything that you have to say so much. And I know everyone on here and the whole class really benefits a lot from your perspective and all the knowledge that you have. So thank you so much. Um, we're gonna just talk about uh, a few next steps here for about 10 minutes. Um, of course, you're welcome to sit on, but if you wanna get back to your family, that is lovely as well. Well, you are very welcome. JA has become um, something that I look forward to 
every year. I think I always tell people this when Reverend G. Furch like pitched this to me, I was like, this will never work. Um, and I am so glad that I was wrong. It has been um, a blessing to me in many, many ways uh, to be a part of JA. And it's something that I look forward to doing um, every year. I'm sorry about that. My, my four-year-old was very upset that I could not give her a hug before oh, she's going to go to bed. So I'm going to go in and uh, <laughs> give her a hug and leave you guys to your business. Awesome. But thanks again for having well, me. You. And I look forward to seeing everybody in person one day. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> okay have a good night. Thanks, Thank you, you too. So I did just want to mention one thing in reference to our next steps. We're going to be um, also sending out. So what we when we talk about next steps, what we mean is that usually after the end of the history class, we do a series of panel discussions that help you kind of take a deeper dive into um, some of the things that we're talking about. These panel discussions are things like a panel of just regular Black people that live in Madison that are talking about what life is like for them. Um, and it allows a chance for you all to do some Q&A uh, we'll also do a panel of white people who have been on this would-be ally journey with us to tell their stories about where they started, where they are, and where they think they need to go, what have been the challenges for that. And then one of my personal favorites is we do a panel of Black elders in Madison. So people who are, you know, 70 plus who've been in Madison for 40, 50, 60 years to share with us what life is like and how much it's changed. So, um, and then we, we sort of finish that off with the social action workshop that helps you think about your spheres of influence and how you might take um, some personal action for that. And then in the fall, um, we'll be sharing some more focused things that are um, looking at specific, like the justified anger focused areas in criminal justice, economic development, family, community wellness, and um, which one did I forget? Did I say criminal justice? Yes, you did. Okay, criminal justice, <laughs> economic development, family and community wellness, and education. Yes. Okay. <laughs> With uh, leadership and capacity development undergirding all of those things. So in the fall, we'll um, give you some ways that you can learn more there, but also helping you to figure out where do you want to personally get engaged yourself. So just keep following our lists for dates and more details related to those things. Um, I did want to address one question that came up in the, in the Q and A which was about what to do about people who are in our jails and prisons and detention centers right now. This is something that has not been getting uh, very much um, press. It gets a little bit here and there. Um, this is an area where we really do need support. Um, people in our correctional facilities, not just people who are prisoners, but people who uh, work there and come in and out every day are really at very high risk of um, this infection. And there's been a lot of very strong efforts around the state um, with our district attorney in Dane County, um, particularly with our state public defender um, and with many different people in the system filing motions and petitions to get people out who are either at very high risk or have committed nonviolent crimes or are um, what we call short time, so are about to be released. Um, but there's a lot more that we can do. And if that's an area you're concerned with, absolutely, we need you to be writing, um, write the sheriff, write the Department of Corrections, um, get on the phone with your legislators and let them know that this is something that matters to you. We really need assistance there. Um, Nehemiah has been scheduled to do a reentry conference, our second annual at the end of this month. Of course, with everything else going on, we've postponed that. We're going to do a virtual conference in September, but we will be having a number of videos um, and sort of informational things coming up, as well as our scheduled date, April 23rd and 24th, that's dealing with what people on the inside, their families and um, staff are experiencing right now. We'll be giving you some updates on that. So if you're interested in that, even if you're not interested in that, uh, tune in because you're gonna learn a lot from that. Um, so we do have one short video to play. Uh, Dr. G, did you want me to play that now or do you wanna comment first? Um, why don't we play that now? Okay. Uh, While you're queuing it up, I will say many have been asking, um, can they help with donations of perish non-perishable food items and canned goods? Right now, it's so dangerous in, in, in trying to figure out how do we protect the safety of individuals who will be helping to hand those things out. But as Dr. Reese said, please follow um, our emails because 
at some point, we will have some suggestions of how we can all do our part in providing some much needed food and relief. All right. Yeah, and you can just put those things aside for now, but please, please check those expiration dates because if you don't want to eat a five-year-old can of carrots, I promise you no one else does. So please just keep that in mind. Here we go. of black leaders to help us address these issues and help us to shape an agenda that comes from the black community for the black community. But we're also training white allies and non-black allies who can help us to dismantle these racist systems that the two, by partnering together, this can become a national model of how we eradicate racism and its disparities, health, economically, mass incarceration, and otherwise. Because of the class, I feel like there are opportunities I can take advantage of to help fight racism. I'm really excited to have gotten connected to an organization like Nehemiah that's a lot led by black leaders in the community and is doing a lot of good work. We have the wherewithal and we have the goods. The question is, do we have the will to change this on our watch? Thank you, thank you. That's I, I love seeing that every time, every time we get a chance to show it. So, um, team, I think I've said everything I need to say. I just I appreciate you all um, so much. Um, I hope that tonight was not only informative, but uh, much needed um, um, distraction from all the negative and sad things that are happening in our world. It's great to know that we're still looking at what we can do to make it a more just and equitable world, and that's what we're really about. We're about addressing the issues today but still talking about the issues that we have not yet addressed that are causing today to be so difficult. So thank you for journeying with us, for being willing to become an ally and for restoring my confidence in this process. Um, while, we, while the lecture was going on, I just sent out a tweet and said um, 100 plus folk, 150 folks are digitally experiencing this history course and this has given me confidence in what we can do together with, with, with white allies, with non-black allies, with non-black allies. So thank you all so much for journeying with us and let's not let the journey end here. Um, Harry, Karen, anything else you want to say or need to say? Um, I, I will say one thing. I know that some people have been donating. Um, and so I want to say thank you for those who've already ex um, expressed their generosity and concern for this. So um, thank you for that. We appreciate it. Um, I'm, and one of the things that I, I saw that really touched me was right when people were taking things off the shelves and hoarding things, uh, we had someone who gave a $10 donation. And I thought that was really impactful, not because it was the biggest gift, but because that $10 could have been, you know, a couple of bottles of alcohol or hand sanitizer or toilet paper. Oh, but instead someone chose to give um, what they could. And so all of those gifts are very meaningful and help us take care of those people who are being most impacted by that. So thank you for that. We appreciate it. Um, Dr. Reese, anything you want to add? No, just thank you so much for joining us. Um, this was a big deal for us jumping in the webinar world in a couple of days. So we, it's exciting. Thanks for being part of that too, Cohort 5. <laughs> and and thanks again, for your grace. Yes, thank you for your grace <laughs> and, and for your patience. And again, what we, what we want to, to reiterate is that Nehemiah is in a real unique position because not only do we build capacity inside those who are the most disenfranchised among us, we're building bridges to individuals like yourselves. And our plan is to bring those two, those two groups together to create your own solutions so that you don't have to look to us to do it, 
but together by having these meaningful relationships, you can really do it. And so understand that when you support us, it's helping to take care of the current crisis, but this is just a new crisis for so many people. The new norm for that we're referring to is still a very, very ugly norm for many of the people we serve because they're already behind. So thank you for taking out this time to listen and to hear and to understand that allies inform themselves, allies keep learning, allies share what they learn, but allies also support. They support work that's, that's making a difference in the community. And we will continue to update you on the great work that we're doing. So stay connected. And I hope that in some way we can, um, we can offer you a rain check for a potluck in the summer. At some point we are gonna come out of our homes and we're really hoping that we can have a really cool potluck together. But until then, keep watching it, keep coming to the website, keep looking at the comments on social media, keep reading your emails. We really appreciate you. Let's work together to create a stronger Madison for everybody. Thank Thanks you. everyone, have a great night. Be safe, please be safe.